I'm gonna put it right here. We do World War Three update. So I can't find any play. Everybody's out, out and about today. It's in the pluses, and uh, everybody's out and about doing what? It, there's a hockey uh, tournament up in uh, uh, Otter Lake. Uh, the rink. There's kids on the rink here. Everybody's out. It's like kind of like the first real nice day this year. Uh, so everybody's out and about. So I figured I'll do my World War Three update here. I got like four videos to make today, and uh, it's just like. It's like, it's kind of like, gets that kind of spring feeling where you just, you can't concentrate on anything because everything's nice. And went up to Otter Lake, and of course, you know, there's women out, stuff like that too, even if they're not like scantily clad yet, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. But the, you know, it's just, you know, you, you're like, it's spring, right? It's like, it's like, ah, oh, you can't concentrate on anything. So anyway, yeah, you, you bastards make me freaking, this is how dedicated I am to my channel. That even on a spring day when there's out, women out there playing hockey and uh, stuff like that, I'm, I'm here at the hall making a video for you guys. Remember that. Remember that. Anyway, okay. Uh, Trump uh, approval rating is up by 55%. Now, like all polls, you know, you got to take them with a grain of salt. But some numbers I can throw at you. Uh, Ronald Reagan was like 58%. Obama, I think, hit 42, 43, maybe 44, 45% at one point. Um, I think uh, the highest uh, was John F. Kennedy was 73%. So think about it this way. The second highest would be Kennedy. Uh, and then I think after that, it's, uh, don't quote me, it might be Truman or something like that. It might be after that. Uh, I, I can't remember which one. And if I'm wrong, I'm sure you guys will correct me. Uh, but uh, he's three points away from the status of Ronald Reagan right now. So that, that tells you a lot. That tells you a lot. If, depending on where the Trump's coming If it's coming from a, a right-wing organization, obviously take it with a grain of salt. But if it's an actual fair, non-bias, usually anything that shows an approval rating uh, against an, uh, a... I'm inclined to believe this number because the approval rating against Obama, okay, you had the media, yeah, some of the, I'll be fair, yeah, the media, they didn't handle Obama, like, for example, CNN and Fox News, they didn't handle Obama with baby gloves, uh, you know, they, but they were cr critical in the right areas, that, that, that's, that's the thing. Um, they basically definitely were off the ball with uh, Clinton, uh, that type of thing. But with Trump, I think the approval rating is probably actually higher than that. Like, I truly believe Trump has beyond the majority. Uh, let's look at it this way. Right now, you can look at it again as a war going on within the intelligence agencies and everything like that. Trying to overthrow. They're still trying to overthrow Trump. Like, he's made it to the, you know, to the third stage of, of becoming a president. You know, he went through the campaign. They couldn't take him out there. He won the, the vote. They couldn't take him out there, and he made it through the inauguration. So now they're trying to maybe... Take out his, um, his, uh, his, the people around him that are basically there to support him, like Flynn. But I'm thinking Flynn might be a long con because Flynn did nothing wrong. There was no reason to fire this guy. I think what Flynn, Flynn was was a plan to expose uh, who's leaking the intel. That's what I think. That, like, it's, it's becoming obvious because it looks like Trump does something that, oh, why, Mr. Trump, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing that. And then it turns around and it's like, oh, wait a minute, he's setting himself for, bang, take out this, you know, the response is this, this, and this, and then it sets the people either on his side or the law on his side that he could take out his opponents. It's a very clever game. I, we keep underestimating Trump. Uh, is he a good guy, a bad guy? I don't know. In this world, I don't think there's any, in, when it comes to politics, I don't think there are any good guys. Uh, but nothing is ever black or white. It's always a gray area, and it's really hard to get into the gray area with Trump. I mean, I still don't know what to make of him myself. We can only judge him on his actions. But then he'll do an action that looks like it's the total wrong move, and uh, this guy's being a belligerent idiot, and then, it, wow, look what he just set himself up for, and I'll, and I'll get into it in a second. Um, the, tr the Trump travel ban, okay, which many Middle Eastern uh, factions around the world are saying, no, it's probably a good idea. We've got lots of extremism here. You don't want that in your country. You better lock up your borders. Yeah. So he's got support there. Now, of course, I woke up this morning, and uh, even though it's a beautiful, beautiful spring day, to wake up to find more illegal, uh, and I think this was staged by the CBC, the fact that they had the cameras there right when all these freaking migrants are coming, and they're not persecuted in the states. So they have no reason to be coming to, into our country illegally. Uh, and then if you've got the opposition party like Thomas Mulcair saying, get rid of that third uh, state uh, travel ban thing where basically if uh, a migrant, let's say somebody from the Sudan is fleeing war and they make it to a European country or to the states or whatever, and they want to come to us and still claim refugee status. Well, the conservatives put in a, ba a ban on that a, a few years back where you can't do that anymore because once you make it to a safe country, you're no longer an asylum seeker. At that point, you're an economic migrant, and that is correct. 
you know, that is correct. Uh, but even the conservatives, because they want to appear to be racist, are, are kind of reneging on their own policy. And it's like, no, you know, explain why you put that in. Most people agree with you. So they got the RCMP out there waiting on one side of the U.S., uh, on the Canadian side of the border, and you got a state trooper on the other side trying to stop the, this family of migrants from crossing, and you got this other guy with a backpack. And we don't know if this guy's a Jew. We don't even know if they're bringing in diseases. I mean, there is no reason for anybody to be illegal, and there is no reason for anybody to be crossing uh, just anywhere. I mean, it just shows you how little respect these people have for our country. Oh, oh well, we're freeing persecution. Okay, if you're truly freeing persecution, okay, you're going to go to the border, and you're going to come through the, the front door. But they're not doing that because they know at the uh, if they go to a border, that law will apply. But because they, they cross at anywhere, this idea that, you know, you step one foot on our, our soil, you become a citizen, that, that is, that's ridiculous. We can't do that. And people are just taking advantage of that. Now, I don't blame the migrants for taking advantage of it. It pisses me off. Don't get me wrong. It pisses me off. And trust me, the anti-Muslim sentiment in Canada is going up because of things like that. The, you know, if they really wanted to do it right, to do right, but these families are just coming in for better welfare. That's what they're coming in for. Uh, they'll give you all the sob story on the CBC, but I think these these um, you know these sob story kind of pieces that the CBC is doing to get the migrants uh, to show them in Galen. It's going to show because people see the bullshit. They know that these people are not coming in for legitimate reasons. There is no re there's nobody coming. When Randy Quaid tried to get asylum up here in Canada, it didn't work for him. And because everybody, well, number one, he was nuts. Uh, number two, uh, but although he might have a point with his Star Whackers thing, but you know, he does need a little bit more proof. But uh, the, the case in point is, he wasn't fleeing, like, he wasn't, like, the, the, this family saying, well, we're coming from, like, the Sudan uh, originally. Yeah, but that was after you went to a European country, then to the States, and then to here. You're not fleeing persecution. You know, if Donald Trump had people put up against the wall and shot, then you could say, yeah, if you were coming directly from the Sudan to here, you might have a case, uh, or Syria, or wherever it might be. But you get the idea that these people, they're just taking advantage. So that's starting, it's not as bad as Europe because they can't just flood in in mass numbers. But a thousand people in a week, that, that's too much for Canada. So that's, times that by the welfare, so you're looking at about 600 bucks a person per month to take care of, probably somewhere around that. A thousand people. Do the math. Then, where's your retirement going? Where is, why is our, our hospitals closing? Or, or wait times so astronomical? Uh, why are, you know, the potholes? Uh, like, again, these people are taking advantage. And unfortunately, all the parties are so focused on political correctness. Uh, some are focused on Agenda 2030, like the Liberals and the, and the, uh, the uh, NDP. But the, the, the and globalism is, is the game of, of, of the Conservatives. So they're not in the best interest of Canadians right now. And I think people need to really start calling their government, stop that. Change that law ASAP, uh, ASAP, make it apply our entire, either we have a border or we don't. Uh, these people could be bringing in drugs. They could be bringing in all kinds of, maybe they're legitimate. Maybe they're bringing in diseases. I mean, there's a billion reasons why uh, there should be no reason for illegal uh, immigration. Anyway, I've been saying this for years. So I understand what the states is going through. I even understand what Mexico is going through with wanting to build a wall on its southern border that nobody seems to want to talk about to keep the Guatemalans out. I get that. And again, I don't blame the Guatemalans, and I don't blame the, the Mexicans for wanting to protect their border either. Um, it's a logical thing. But uh, that was tough. So we're seeing that, that that's riling up, you know. Uh, the Trump speech is about an hour and 16 minutes long. I still didn't get to watch that Netanyahu uh, Trump, spe uh, Trump uh, meeting yet. That one, I think, is going to be very telling on, on which direction Trump is going to go uh, once I watch it. Uh, but the other one was an excellent speech. All I was going to say is just, I already did a video on it yesterday, so you can go watch that video from the making of this video. Uh, and you can just go watch that actual speech. Now, of course, the mainstream media, they're taking, you know, oh, he's just attacking the mainstream media. He's attacking. They will not show what he was really talking about. Anybody, like, the reason why Trump's approval rate is probably at 55% is because of speeches like that. So, yeah, he, he makes a complete mockery of CNN and stuff like that, and rightfully so. Look, I believe in freedom of speech. I believe in freedom of criticism. I believe in the freedom of press 100%. But just because you're the press doesn't mean you can't be criticized too. You know what I mean? Like, like, where did that become a standard where politicians have to be afraid of you all the time? The only reason why a politician should be afraid of you is because they're corrupt. When they're not afraid of you, that, that's kind of telling. That means they're uh, whatever. But you can see how the deep state and the, basically in this speech, he's basically showing how the intelligence service is working with the media. Meaning, there's a major problem, treasonous problem in the country. And I think he's setting himself up to uh, take that stuff out. Um, yeah, so anyway. Uh, police to open fire on protesters. Uh, this is a new law coming in um, in France. Uh, basically, this is for 
the, the police in France right now, the Muslims have pretty much been rioting like crazy. Not just the Muslims, but the, the radical left uh, as well in, in, in uh, these the, the no-go zones as well. They're burning cars like it's going. I don't know. There might be like three vehicles left in, in France or Sweden at this point. Like, I, 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 you know... When they, what they, after they're done burning, the Muslims are done burning all the cars. I guess they're going to work on bicycles next. I don't know what they're going to do. Um, but anyway, the police are allowed to give, going to be allowed to give two warnings, and then they can open fire on you, lethal force. So what some people think is going on is because they're so afraid Marine Le Pen is going to win the election that if they can, they know as soon as that uh, the co- like. The cops in France, as soon as they kill a Muslim, that's it. You're going to have a civil war in the 10th Crusade, which I'm going to do a separate video on that. Uh, i got so many videos to do today, it's unbelievable. But um, the, the thing about that is that it will kick off martial law. That's what it's going to do. That's what it's designed. Start the civil war, have martial law cancel the election, which then you'll have real civil war. Uh, so for France, it's war no matter which way they go. If they let the migrants come in anymore, they're going to have a jihad, you know, a holy war. Or, you know, like the, the 10th Crusade type of thing. Uh, if they don't, if they try to get rid of them, they're going to have a 10th Crusade. If Marine Le Pen wins, uh, the Muslims are going to riot. If uh, they allow this uh, law to go through and they start killing protesters, well, they're going to get, you know, it, it's, it's insolvent no matter which way you go. So if you're over there in France, prepare for civil war is what I'm telling you. Uh, it's going to get bad. Um, Cora Gold, uh, U.S., uh, this is, uh, or sorry, uh, Cora Gold, uh, this is a drill that the U.S. is doing with the Phil- uh, Thailand. And it's an amphibious assault. Uh, RT had a little bit of footage of it. And basically, this is, you know, basically to go from Thailand, you know, basically to fight an island hopping war. That type of thing that's going on. Sca- uh, Can- Canada. Uh, Canada here is spending, uh, um, we had that NATO meeting, and then of course, uh, there was um, a lot of uh, kind of NATO pay-, pay your fair share from the U.S. Uh, that two percent we pay, pay is something like 0.99 percent, uh, not quite one percent of our GDP. Which is uh, think of if we were to cut that, I think we should be out of NATO anyway. Uh, cut that, bring that money home. Number one, start up our own weapons programs, stuff like that. We could do all that, become a neutral country. We could have a, a phenomenal techno- technologically advanced country, uh, and probably even give it a tax break. Not only a tax break, but we could take some of that money, put it back into healthcare, veterans affairs, all kinds of stuff like that, and research and development for you know military stuff, and protecting our borders so we don't have people just walking across them, that type of thing. You know, I'm just saying. Uh, Canada also is to um, send about. Uh, they have about 600 troops in uh, Latvia right now. Uh, I think we're the biggest group there. Uh, so basically, when the war starts, we're going to have 600 Canadians fighting Russians, and that's not going to be good. Uh, what, what are we doing there? You know what I mean? I'm nothing against the Latvian people, but what are we doing there? Uh, that type of thing. Uh, it's, you know, these people aren't paying us to be there, whatever. And once you start paying people to be there, then you're mercenaries, right? So uh, we should be neutral anyway. Uh, yeah, the uh, other thing too is Canada also is going to be selling more weapons to Yemen, or, or to, uh, to the Saudis to fight Yemen and Yemen. And... Um, yeah, so like anti, uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine, I was listening to Parliament in Parliament. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm cheating today. Um, but uh, Bazan, uh, Mr. Bazan, this guy, well, he's Ukrainian, so uh, this man, I wish he cared more about Canada than he does about the Ukraine. You know what I mean? I have no problem with the dual citizens. Or, I don't think he's a dual citizen. I think he's just Ukrainian descent. But you have to, you know... It's not up to Canada to go fight for, in the Ukraine. There, there's no reason for us to be there. But the Conservative Party's stance is uh, anti-Russia, anti-Russia, anti-Russia. Uh, Trudeau's, Trudeau doesn't really have a stance on Russia when you really look at it. He doesn't really have a stance on Russia. I think he's just trying to kind of avoid that at all costs because there's no good way for him to go there. If he does, uh, but what they're talking about in, in, is to arm, and even the NDP's on with this for a bit, that we should be sending lethal aid to Ukraine. No, we should not be sending any weapons. To, we shouldn't be arming the Kurds. We shouldn't be in Latvia. We shouldn't be doing anything like that. And we definitely shouldn't be sending our peacekeepers to African countries to go shoot child soldiers because that's what we're going to end up doing. Uh, and, of course, we know that when these sol- our Canadian soldiers come back after they shot 12-year-olds with AKs, uh, there's going to be no proper uh, veterans affairs. It's just not going to be able to take care of these people. So we shouldn't send them there in the first place uh, just so we could be the politically correct do-gooders. And I'm against peace. I'm either peace or war. I'm not for peacekeepers because it puts them at risk. Uh, in You have to play referee, I get that, but now you have two sides that are possibly going to be shooting at you, which puts the risks way too high. Uh, and on top of that, uh, 
the uh, people station, the Canadian soldier station in Kuwait, uh, it looks like the Liberal government basically uh, took away uh, the, the tax credit they got, which was like a $9,000 tax credit. Got, because they said they weren't in enough dangers to get that, that, that ha extra hazard pay or whatever. Nice, eh? Yeah, we'll send you, yeah. Yeah, anyway. So if that doesn't make your blood boil, understand. And then you wonder why I'm, I'm, I'm you know, want to get out of NATO. I believe in NORAD. I mean, we get the money we waste on NATO, we should actually put in some of that into NORAD. And again, more of a domestic, uh, but until we get a nationalist government, we're never going to have that. We're just going to have war for the uh, war for the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and George Soros and Henry Kissinger and Zygmunt Brzezinski and all those people. We'll be following that plan with the Zionist neocon plan for the Greater Israel Project, which uh, is a big problem in the Middle East. Um, keep going. The uh, deep state is basically at war with Trump. There's no doubt about this. And you got a guy... Uh... uh Oh, I, somewhere down here. Oh, uh, yeah, Joe Sh John Schindler um, got his name in quotes. <laughs> uh, this is a, this guy. Trump will die in jail. Um, again, Steen Steins and Bergs. Most likely, I don't know if this guy's Jewish or not, but is he one of these Jewish neocons? It seems like there's always one of them guys at the power, but it just shows you the mindset. He's talking about uh, you know putting 15 rounds through that MAGA hat of, of Trump's type of thing and taking him out. Well, implying it. He's not saying it direct, but this is the deep state. This is coming from the deep state. This is a guy that works in the CIA or whatever and is basically threatening the president of the United States. Now, whether you like the president or not, it doesn't matter. Even, even if Trump was Satan himself, he's the president of the United States, it's still illegal to do that. Um, but Trump is definitely not that. You know, like he, He's definitely not Satan by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's, uh, that's one thing. Now, another interesting thing, uh, uh, this goes back a bit in time. Again, don't be afraid to go over some of my older World War III updates. But a lot of people wonder what, you know, why, why do these uh, Zionist neocons, not all of them are Jews, a lot of them are Christians too, uh, but, the, you know, the wars for Israel type of thing. Why, why are these people pushing so hard for a war with Russia? Well, remember, back when the Soviet Union collapsed, well, it never collapsed. They just basically, what Yeltsin, uh, Boris Yeltsin did at that time was basically, and this comes back to George Soros, it looks like, they took all the, the resources and, and sold them basically pennies on the dollar and basically diverted the rest of the money into the military state. That's why you're seeing, like, within, like, okay, if they collapsed in the 90s, okay, and you can look at any country that has suffered a collapse. It takes decades upon decades just to get the economy going again. Venezuela, um, Argentina. I mean, Argentina collapses about every five years. They just, they just cannot get anywhere, right? But yet, the Soviet Union empire goes down. All these Zionist oligarchs come in. And how they did it is kind of uh, the same kind of Ponzi scheme that they got going on now. And it's a little bit different, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's the same Ponzi scheme. What they did in Russia was all these Zionist oligarchs, okay, they basically, you got a voucher, the, these, these bonds, I wouldn't call them bonds, but uh, they were called, uh, uh, yeah, Uti uh, utilities for cash or something like that. Basically, uh, you take out, because the cash went completely, the, the ruble uh, went completely worthless. So you could either get gold or silver, or you could sell these things. So what they did is they sold all these paper IOUs, so to speak, to these Zionist oligarchs, right? And then, once they started the system over again, they took all that and basically bought all the shares and all, like, they bought up all the shares, they bought up everything, and then basically, they were, like I say, got all the resources, pennies on the dollar. Putin came along, kicked these guys out of the country. And these guys are, these are basically crybabies. These are guys that basically scam the system. You know, people would, you know, they, they would basically sell off these little... IOUs, because the Russian people were like, well, you know, these things are going to be worthless. There's no point in us hanging on to them. If these idiots over here want to buy them from us, fine. But they didn't realize what they were doing. This was a scam. Again, problem, reaction, solution. So they bought these bonds or whatever for pretty much one-tenth of what they were worth. Okay. And then, you know, because people just wanted to dump them because they didn't want to lose all their wealth, you know, all their money from the banks. They didn't want to lose all their wealth. So then what they did is they gave it to these and sold it to these guys, and these guys paid you know, pennies on the dollar for what they were worth. And then, bang, they turned it all in and took over all the resources. And then Putin, that's Putin overthrew these guys, these oligarchs, back when he came in. And when he did that, he exiled some of them, put some of them in jail, and told some of them, you come back here, we're going to kill you. <laughs> you know what I mean? That type of thing. Well, that same faction, 
a lot of those guys who were all linked with George Soros, now they're arm's length, like every NGO group, they're arm's length from George Soros. Well, where did those guys end up? Well, a lot of them end up in Goldman Sachs. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, that's where they ended up. So it's, it's the same freaking crowd. It's just the Russians kicked that problem out, and they ended up on all these other places, and one of the places they end up is in the, in the United States. So these guys are trying to fight to get that back, right? But they're, willi- they're so crazy, they're willing to start a nuclear war with Russia to do this. So... Um, in Trump's speech, he was talking about how a thermonuclear war with Russia would be a bad idea. I won't go too much into the Trump speech, because there was a lot said there. Uh, you know, like, it goes, uh, working with Russia is good, taking out their warship off our coast is bad. But to the media, that would be the best thing ever. You know, uh, you know what I mean? Like, they're, they're that insane. And, and again, if you took out a Russian warship in international waters, you better believe there would be missiles within a half an hour. Um, yeah, we don't want that. And I don't think Trump wants that. I don't think... Putin wants that, but I think what that meeting was really about was signaling to Putin that, no, we are still going to work with you, but we're going to work with you from a position of strength. So we're going to, this is why I think Trump took no action against that ship, because yes, the Russians took action against the the, war, the U.S. warship in the Black Sea like they normally do. They sent out four SU-24s, and they buzzed it, or three SU-24s, and, and a, uh, not an IL-38, IL-38 or whatever, uh, they, 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 sub, uh, you know, electronic warfare aircraft. Buzz, the U.S. warship, but the U.S. didn't do anything with this other warship. Donald Trump clearly knew about it, and that's not a sign of weakness. In fact, I think that was a brilliant move if he keeps doing this. Send out a B-52, put it along the Russian bomber, get some Su-27s to scramble and come up and meet the bomber. But the next time the Russians send out a bomber, just leave your F-16s on the ground unless they come into the territory. Let them even come into the territory uh, quite a bit before you scramble them. And then that's like, but if you can let these bombers go by without without intercepting, every time the Russians do something, it'll look like they're overreacting. You know, when you don't react, you, well, your warship went by. We didn't do nothing. You know, that was fine. It was an inter- and, and technically, it was, there was no, no problem. So, but there's a lot more going on why the Russians buzzed the U.S. warship. If it was just about one warship, they wouldn't care. It's about the 7,000 troops in Eastern Europe with NATO. That's what it's about, uh, that type of thing. So the Russians, like Trump said, uh, Putin's probably sitting there at his desk saying, we can't work with the Ru- we can't. You know, we, we can't negotiate with the United States. But it does look like the Russians are signaling on the PR front, so hopefully they mean it. And Trump is signaling that, no, I am fighting, you know, he's signaling to Putin that I am fighting my own faction as well that wants to go to war with you. I'm fighting against them. So hopefully that Put, uh, Putin and Trump, Putin gets the message from Trump. Because Putin keeps le- leading out, for example, again, take this one with a grain of salt, but on one of my last reports, don't be afraid to go over some of my old reports, where I was talking about how Putin was saying that he was willing to give S- Snowden to the to the United States as kind of like a, like a, a peace honoring type of thing. He called Snowden a traitor and a spy. <laughs> you know, th- I can't see that being real, but if it is, I mean, that's, that's uh, yeah that type of thing. Uh, keep going on. So hopefully that's, that's what was that, that was about. Uh, yeah, loans for shares was that Soros thing. And uh, yeah, so there could be a bit of that going on. Robert, uh, Robert uh, Howard uh, is going to replace uh, Flynn. I'm thinking the whole Flynn deal is a part against the deep state. Again, Flynn really tra- technically did nothing wrong. The media, he's exposed, but what he did do was expose that there was a leak. And that the leak is coming from the CIA and the FBI and, and wherever and the NSA. He's basically Trump is flushing out the NSA. I think this was a flush out to find out who's doing the leaking, and they're leaking it to the mainstream media. So uh, Trump made a very um, good comment in his speech, saying, "Look, I talked to the Mexican president. It's on the news before I'm even off the phone. You know what I mean? That's not good because that means you can't trust your intelligence agency." And he's not doing it to pr- pr- uh, to prove it to the to the to the intelligence officers. No, he's doing it to prove it to the people. Look, I was on a phone call. It's on the mainstream news. I was talking to the Australian Prime Minister. It's on the mainstream news. Uh, I was on uh, talking to uh, you know Mexico and, and, and Australia and somebody else, and it was on the mainstream news. And he goes, "That's not good. You know, that, that's treason. <laughs> you know, basically. And that's what people are going to look at. It's like, okay, well." We got, we got a mole. We got moles all throughout the, you know, and these are lobbyist groups. A lot of them is this the old Obama faction and the Clinton faction. Well, it's not Obama faction. It's Rothschild, Rockefeller. Obama was a puppet. Clinton's a puppet. It's that faction that's trying to protect them. Well, again, they're fighting to, for their own survival. So Trump exposes this, but he's exposing it for the people. The people are looking at this saying, and he goes, he goes, what happens when, you know, if I got an intelligence agency that's leaking every freaking thing to the press, what happens when I'm dealing with, say, North Korea? You know what I mean? Uh, we don't want that leaking to the press. That, that could be dangerous. 
and especially the way the, tr- the press is trying to inflame, inflame war and everything like that. Uh, you know, Trump's making a good point there. So I think this is what Flynn was about. I think Flynn knew he was probably going to lose his job way ahead of time. And this, he, I, what I'm thinking is Trump has probably got a whole bunch of people. He's playing cards. He's playing chess. If he's doing what I'm thinking he's doing, he's going to bring in people. There's going to be a scandal. Those people will lose their job, but in the process, he'll take out a whole bunch of things. For example, the executive order for the travel ban. I thought he did it the wrong way at first. Because you don't strand people at airports, even if it's only 100 and some odd people. Yeah, the people are blowing it out of proportion. But considering what's at stake, yes, there's going to be a lot of the populace that doesn't understand what's going on. But if he did what I think he just did, he's now exposed the Ninth Circuit Court, okay, which he's also set them up to be removed. uh, And the legal binding to remove that. So he's going to make the appeal, and he's just going to throw appeal after or executive order after executive order at these people to the point, well, I'll comply with your demands, and then bang. And that Supreme Court judge, who was a Bush appointee, surprise, surprise, um, he may have had a legal thing, but there might be some of the stuff where we could look at it and say, ah, no, that judge was wrong. He needs to be removed. So now he can remove, that's, if we see these judges removed, then we understand what play, which is a brilliant play. Again, we're constantly, whether it's for the good or for the bad, Trump is a lot smarter than we give him credit for. He does act like a bull in a china shop and acts like a big dumb bully thug. But it doesn't mean he doesn't know what he's doing. That said, can he make a miscalculation? That's true. But again, we still don't know if he's the good guy or the bad guy yet. So he's, I'm thinking, the other thing he's done, again, he's signaling so hard that he's getting ready to, to, to trigger an economic collapse and get basically get the United States through basically a bankruptcy is, is what he's going to do. He know, that's what I think he's really out there to do. Um, Janet Yellen's out there saying that um, no, um, the economy's not doing good. It was doing great for eight years, and all of a sudden it's not doing good. But it's still under Obama's policies, right? So that type of thing. So and Trump is well, I inherited a mess. You know, the economy is a wreck. You will be able to track Trump from his day one of his campaign right through, saying the economy is going to collapse. It's the biggest bubble in history. That is a, there's nothing the mainstream media can do now. So everything he's going to be able to spin this so fast on the bankers, which means hopefully he'll get rid of too big to fail. Yes, he got rid of Dot Frank, which looks like a bad move, but maybe there's something in Dot Frank that I'm not aware of that it, with it out of the way, it allows him to say, you know what, we, we don't have to bail you out anymore. So that type of thing. I don't know. Uh, who knows? I don't know. We'll only know if that's what he does. Uh, moving along. Um, Russia uh, tests uh, that missile... This goes back to 2014. Obama didn't deal with it. Trump's out there saying because Obama didn't deal with that violation, that 1987 uh, arms treaty deal for those missiles, because he didn't deal with it in 2014, I have to deal with it now. Again, he keeps kind of pulling up the past, saying, look, Obama was such a great president, why didn't he deal deal with that back then? Kind of like when he told Hillary Clinton, you know, you had 30 years to fix these problems and you're worried about it now, you know what I mean? That type of thing. So he still has to put Clinton in jail, but I think that comes later. I think he's got, because he's, he, he's fighting, he's, the narcissism of, of us wanting justice uh, uh, from the witch hunt angle, I get. You know, we want the Clintons in jail. We want Rothschilds, Rockefellers, uh, George Soros, Henry Kissinger, Zygmunt Brzezinski. We want them people in jail and everybody underneath them. But I think we ha- what Trump is doing is he's putting his ducks in the row so that within the second year, when he starts pulling the trigger on those ducks, that it's just bang, domino, 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 and there'll be no defense from the deep state at all. He's taking out the deep state, which is running the major defense for these people. That's the thing you got to look at. So we'll have to watch and see what happens. But that's if he's the good guy. If he's not, well, you know. And he can fail at this, too. If he fails at this, it's going to be bad. Um, uh, the, uh, in the EU, they're trying to pass a law so that uh, migrants can vote in the next election. Meaning... They don't want... They know that their, their sign is nigh for them. So, they, you know, if they can get these migrants to vote, but... It's hard to say. The migrants, whether they vote or not, is, is usually migrants don't vote that much. They, they really don't. They just go with the flow, right? Uh, but the idea, I think, is to overthrow the pen. I don't think they're going to be able to stop Geet Wilders. It's hard to say he might win. Uh, Marine Le Pen is a 50-50 chance because... If what happened in the last election happens in this election, uh, all they did is she would have probably won the last election, but they, the other leftist party just gave all their votes to Sarkozy, or uh, to Hollande, or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, so if they do that again, I don't think they could pull that off again. And I think that the polls are probably showing them, the true polls are probably showing the French government that, no, she is going to take the primaries, and then she's going to take the whole thing. I mean, a week of Muslims rioting in your country... Uh, 
uh, you know, again, it, did a guy get a sodomized by a, 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 a French police officer? Did a migrant get sodomized by that? I don't know. Maybe, let's say it's 100% true. It still doesn't justify, uh, yeah, I can see a week worth of protests, but justifying a week worth of burning everybody's property and destroying stores and attacking people and all that? No. <laughs> That'll just get you war. Um, yeah. So, and, and I have some subscribers from France, and I always love to hear from you guys. I was listening to one girl on Red Ice, and she's like, yeah, these, these, it, it's, it's going crazy there. It's not everywhere, but in, like, Paris and, you know, the, 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 the major cities and around these no-go zones, like, the, the police can't go in there. Uh, so, I think what they might be doing, like I said earlier, if they can get a couple of Muslims shot, it'll rile them up, then they can bring in the military and crack down on them that way, but it all, I think the main thing is to, to stop the election in France. Uh, that's what I think they're going to buy time so that the EU could put in a law like this. But this is also for the German elections. If, they, if the EU loses Germany, they lose everything, you know what I mean? Uh, that type of thing. So, we'll have to see if the AFD gets in it there. Kim Jong Nam, uh, Kim Jong Un's brother... Apparently there was a hit on this guy for five years by the North Korean government. So we still don't know what happened there. There's a couple of stories. There was uh, one story. There was two ladies. Uh, there was one threw something on him, and then he died. And the other one is uh, one of the ladies stabbed him with a needle, and then he died. So whatever. But I don't know. Um, China and North Korea, I think China's kind of signaling to North Korea to chill out a bit. But we'll see. Um, Yeah, a uh, little off topic, but uh, down there in Ontario, uh, Bill C-28, basically mom and dad don't exist anymore. Uh, you can have something like four or five different sets of parents on official documents down there. And Kathleen wins uh, progressive agenda. Um, Pitikanan, Pitikanan, uh, Pitikanan, Pitikanan, I can't, I can't speak today. Uh, Island. Pitikern, I guess is how you'd say it, Pitikern. This island is basically, there's a population of 50. It is a, goes back to the uh, HMCS bounty. That far back, we're talking colonial times, right? This is one of uh, the British colonies. I believe it's in the, uh, not the Marshall Islands, but the, uh, uh, what's the, it's just below Africa, like South Africa's here, it, the island's like down here. Uh, what do you call those islands? Uh, Canary Islands. Canary Islands? Virgin Islands or Canary Islands? Anyone, one, one of those. And there's 50 people there. Now, it's a 2.2 mile island, and basically there's 50 residents left, and you can get free land. Okay, and I'm thinking Alt-Right Island here. Free land, free startup, mind you, this is, you're, this is a pretty remote island, and you can go, there's not much of an economy, or whatever, but you know, it's not like it's going to cost you a gazillion dollars to live there. Uh, just something to look at. These are some of the islands I'm looking at. So in four years, I may be heading to an island such as that, but it would be a British colony. Uh, the populace, uh, I don't know what nationality they would actually be. Uh, they, they're kind of, well, there's obviously British, so that's there, but the uh, hosting population, I don't know how many, we're talking 50 people. So if you were to send 200 people, 200, uh, 100 males, 100 females, married probably preferably three years or more, with no kids, so that they can go there and have kids, Give them their island, uh, and then you could basically overrun that island, bribe up the people there, give them really good lifestyle, bring in lots of technology for them, uh, whatever. Don't overcrowd the island. Take that island, annex it <laughs> in a few decades, okay? Create your own currency, whatever, and then we can get out of this crazy globalism stuff. Just Again, a lot of people think I, I'm kidding when I'm talking about alt-right. I, I know, I'm, I'm researching that shit big time. Uh, my boat, it's not going to be big enough to make the trip, but if I, if I have to, I have to, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, anyway, just saying. So, uh, P-I-T-C-A-I-R-N. Check it out. They're, they're, they're taking applications. They're taking applications. You know, go, go look at it. Uh, the, there's potential there. There's potential there. Uh, push for Canada to send uh, anti-tank weapons to Ukraine. I already talked about that. Bill C-30 or B Bill C-31. There's two bills I got passed here in Canada. To do, one is to Bill, I think, C-31 is the, the Ukraine-Canada Trade Trade Act. I don't know what's all involved, but I think it has a lot to do with farming. But I'm worried about weapons. Um, I don't really want to be backing the Ukrainians with anti-tank weapons and stuff like that because of blowback down the, down the years when we start seeing Russians trying to get even with Canada for whatever. Uh, it's not our fight. We don't need to be in there. That shouldn't have happened. That's a George Soros back coup anyway. The other one 
is Bill C-30. CETA has passed in Canada. There's coming up with the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. That didn't go through yet. But there's a new version of that. It's even worse than the last one, from what I understand. So CETA, I think, is going to screw over pretty much our dairy farmers here in Canada. Uh, all sides of the government. Again, we need a, if there was a time for a nationalist government in Canada, now's it. we got less than a year, two and a half years to get things rolling. What we need is people to basically go over, balance the budget. There's a lot of stuff we can cut, such as things like these big trade deals and whatever. Renegotiate that. We need to renegotiate NAFTA. We, we de- need to do these things. We need to put Canadians first. We don't need to do, wipe out everything overnight because that'll just hurt everybody and won't, won't get anywhere. Repeal and replace, we need to do that. Stop these big trade deals. The other one is stop the refugees, stop mass immigration, take some of that money, pay off the budget, or uh, balance the budget. Once we balance the budget, start reinvesting in our hospitals and stuff like that. Uh, The other thing we need to do is basically put Canadians first. We need people who know the government well so they know what we can get away with right away. Um, That's another video for another time. I am serious about that. I I really, you know, it's my last ditch attempt to save my country because I know if Trudeau gets in again in another four years, uh, we could take another four years of the Conservatives because that will set us up for a nationalist government because they would balance the budget. Uh, but another four years of Trudeau out of half a million people coming into the country, we, we've lost the country. And at that point, you might want to take up my ideas on alt-right islands. Uh, and there's, there's a whole bunch of them. There's, there's bases, there's forts, there's castles in the middle of the freaking ocean that nobody lives in. We could reclaim those. Maritime law, if something is abandoned for more than, I think, six or eight months, you can claim it if it's officially abandoned. Even if it's a sovereign territory of another country, you can make a claim on it. Maritime law is a bitch that way. Uh, mind you, if it's a country with a big military, you might not want to do that because they could just always come and kill you. But you get the idea. There are islands out there as a, as a, as a backup plan. So backup plan in four years. Uh, the SS White Hope is going to take out. Call me a white supremacist if you want, but I'm, I'm thinking of European-centric uh, Western ideologies, anti-communism, anti-globalism, uh, very nationalist and very progressive scientifically. A, a, a nation where... Uh, think about it this way, where most things would be uh, free of service uh, and you would just pay the government workers to, to do what that, but it wouldn't be like paper pushing like crazy, no. It wouldn't be that. It would be more of, okay, for example, we're going to have somebody man the, um, the uh, what's called, the observatory. So, and then, the, you know, use those services for around the world. Uh, we're going to have communications, that type of thing. This stuff, the technology, we just have to duplicate the technology. And then we can use some of that stuff to sell. For example, uh, websites, stuff like that, revenue, ad revenue. We could still do use a lot of things that are already in play today. The other things we could do is stuff like, is take, you know, do barter and trade uh, with, say, Venezuela. Okay, Venezuela, tell you what, we'll build you this, you give us some of your oil. We'll buy, and here's how, here's how we get currency right away. We take 50 bucks, okay, 50 bucks, that's it. We go and we buy 50 bucks worth of Venezuelan currency today. Or if there's a currency even more worthless than that. So that, one dollar, one U.S. dollar is 60,000 bucks, I think, of U.S., uh, of uh, Venezuelan currency. So for $100, <laughs> you got about 6 million bucks there. So, okay, that should be enough to float the economy. You know, you go buy $1,000 worth, we got, uh, you know, we'll buy like, I don't know, maybe $12 trillion worth of Venezuelan currency, so maybe 10 grand's worth. So you got a whole, maybe about 100 people, we kick in 10 grand, we go buy <laughs> more money. We're going to have to burn something because we won't know where to put it all. And we use that on, as a, you know, a regular currency. We use that as a regular currency until we replace it with our own currency. But these are just ideas. These are just ideas. And I would do this with Canada. Uh, I would basically restore the Bank of Canada as a prime minister and stuff like that. But again, I'm getting a bit scatterbrained here. i got to get back on to track. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so Flynn was anti-neocon, so I, I'm thinking Flynn was definitely um, a guy that was out there to, uh, I still gotta get, okay, well, I'm on the second side, so, I think he was there, I think he was the, the firecracker to go down the hole to flush out the, the groundhogs, uh, like I've been saying, Trump's been dropping firecrackers and holes, and all the groundhogs jump up, now you know where they are, and I think that's what Flynn is, and I think there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to sacri- sacrifice their careers for the country, uh, so, to Mr. Flynn, thank you for trying to restore rule of law. You did nothing wrong, but you exposed the system. Good job. Good job. Very clever. And this new guy that, uh, again, this uh, Howard guy, I think he's going to be, he seems to be cut from the same cloth as, as Flynn to a lot of, we, again, I don't know much about him. We'll have to wait and see. So we'll see what he does. 
Um, 86 percent of cash pulled in India. Now, if you're over there in India, let us know what's going on. But I don't think the people there are very happy. <laughs> Those looks like some pretty massive, massive protests going on there. I don't know if they've turned violent yet, but uh, yeah, people are not happy with that. Uh, Trump to uh, uphold uh, the one China policy? Question uh, mark. This is kind of. I don't know what kind of play on words this is. So. The Chinese with their one China policy, so when you go and ask a Chinese person, what do you think of Taiwan, they'll say, there is no Taiwan. Uh, if you know the history between Taiwan and China, you can go get up to speed on that, and then you'll understand what the conflict is about. But basically, the Chinese, in short, had kind of like a coup going on in their country between one group of Chinese and another Chinese, and some of those Chinese got ousted to Taiwan, and then they wanted to basically become a separate nation. And that started the whole kind of thing. That's that's the, the, the two-year-old dumbed-down version of it. It's more complicated than that, yes, I know. But what has happened is that by Trump taking that phone call from the Prime Minister or President of Taiwan, I think it was Prime Minister of Taiwan, uh, by taking that call, that really deeply offended the Chinese. And they say... You know, if Trump doesn't uh, recognize the one China policy, uh, uh, you know, there's going to be hell to pay kind of thing, right? So Trump's out there, yeah, I recognize the one China. But is he saying, I recognize one China as that includes Taiwan and whatever? Or is China's here, Taiwan's there? I recognize China's right over here. I don't know. So take that, take that as what you want. So is that a flip-flop on uh, Trump's behalf? I don't know. With Trump, he's, his flip-flops, are they're very strategic. They, they're, they're starting to show strategic. He's starting to stro- show strategic pattern. I don't know if you guys are picking up on it, but I'm picking up on it. And I'm like, okay, well, he's still signaling that he's the good guy. I don't think this guy does. I don't think this guy takes a shit without planning where that shit's going to drop. You know what I mean? Like that. That's how I think Trump is. Uh, a seven-year-old man that works sixteen hours a day to twenty hours a day is is definitely not a guy who doesn't plan his life. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So Janet Yellen, she already talked about the uh, economic fail. Trump has been kind of warning about this. And he's going to have the biggest I told you so when he, when he triggers the economic collapse. And if he does this within the next 60 to 80 days, or the end of his, his, um, his uh, 90 day or 100 day uh, in office, then he gets to throw that all at the Democrats, all at the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and stuff like that. And the people are going to want blood. When they go uh, to the bank on a Friday night and there's a bank holiday, and they can't get their retirement savings out by the Monday... Um, yeah, and there's runs on banks uh, going on all over the place. I don't keep any more money in the bank than you're willing to lose because we are in uncharted waters here. I uh, got to move this along. So, uh, so there's going to be more troops going into northern Syria. These are U.S. troops. I don't know the number, but basically, um, they they're going to be basically going in there. I don't know what they're doing. If these are the cleanup crews, or if this is going to be doing something different, but something to keep an eye on. Uh, the um, 10th Combat Aviation Brigade uh, is going to Latvia, uh, down to Georgia. Now, these are all those helicopters that showed up. Chinooks, uh, Apaches will be coming later. And I forget how many troops there was um, uh, going down there. But uh, did I... Yeah, so, yeah, 80 helicopters. Okay, again, larger since the Cold War, uh, shipments since the Cold War. And uh, 350 vehicles, this is tanks, Bradleys, um engineering vehicles, whatever, 1,800 personnel to Latvia, to Romania, and Poland. That's where they're going. So, again, we see why the Russians are kind of getting nervous. Um, there's 80-plus exercises scheduled for 2017 in Eastern Europe with NATO. Over a thousand, oh, yeah, I've already talked about over the 1,000 illegal uh, illegals crossing into Canada illegally. Uh, yeah. Zealand, then a little off topic. Uh, there's a continent that they're kind of acknowledging. Uh, it's called Zealandia. Uh, and basically, it's a lost continent right off the coast of Australia and New Zealand. Very, very cool. And it's been rising, and it's uh, it's quite large, and it's it's slowly coming up. They figure this thing is going to appear in probably about 100 years. It's starting to pop up now, so it'll probably... I don't know if it's going to push New Zealand out of the way there, but uh, very interesting, something to look at. Pizzagate, FBI raids adopt... Uh, 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 you know, with adoption agencies and uh, a new Podesta... Basically, uh, there's more stuff on Podesta coming out. These FBI raids are going on. Mainstream media is not talking about it. They're going after the pedophile rings. I think there's been over 400 and some odd arrests already. Look like more to come. So I'm keeping an eye on that. Uh, Take them all down. Burn them all. Uh, Tornado RS-25 rocket launcher. I don't know if you you thought the TOS thing was handsome and nifty and neat. Uh, The uh, new rocket is now the RS-25. Not the... I thought that was already uh, a big one, but this is just a new mobile launcher that the Russians are coming out with. Uh, 
Yeah. The um, ship that, that uh, last ship that just went along the U.S. coast there was SSV-165 uh, Venroff. Intel ship. Uh, I think it was one. It's 165 or 185. I can't remember. But that's what I heard who it was. Uh, yeah, Solomon's Ring, Mount Hermon. Yeah, a lot of action going on on Mount Hermon. This is in uh, basically in the Golan Heights. Uh, this is where UN, it's basically the highest peak. It's where basically uh, Solomon's treasure might be, type of thing. But it's also where apparently the Nephilim and, and the, the fallen angels may have. But there seems to be, like Antarctica, there's a lot of stuff going on there. There seems to be a lot of stuff going on here as well. Something we'll have to keep an eye on. Um, Greek run on the banks again. Uh, yeah, the uh, the Indians are revolting on their cash ban. Uh, so th that's kind of what's going on. Things are getting crazy. Things are getting very violent. Uh, but uh, yeah, I know this is not really the, like an like an update that you're normally used to. Uh, you know, in the sense that it's more military. But you got to understand, like the, the geopolitics part of it is why these machines. There's like though Abrams tanks don't move unless something politically happens. Um, or an actual military incident. So these politics is what leads to the military actions. Just to keep you, uh, keep you in mind. So in, in other words, all wars are bankers' wars. All wars are for Israel. At the end of the day, when you look at it, when you look at the policies, who's want Steen Steinsenberg's always want to go to war. I'm not saying every Jew does, but the ones in power are clearly, clearly, clearly bad shit, crazy and evil, uh, and they're doubling down on the anti-Russian rhetoric. And Trump is again fight. He's got he's got to fight his own guys plus keep world peace at the same time. He's got a lot on his plate. I would say. That said, I think we're going to see more of these kind of one on one conferences where yeah, if the media, the mainstream. The nice thing about the mainstream media is that they they kind of uh, falling for the Saul Alinsky. Like I don't know how they're not picking up on this. You know, it's, it's you know, the, it's kind of like you're using. The master's techniques against the master. You know what I mean? Like, and, and he's not, and he, he can't pick up on it. Like, he can't see it coming. It's like, this is what you teach, you know? Uh, so, we got this kind of bizarre situation where Trump is using Alinsky tactics. And I got that video coming up near the end of the month. Uh, I've got a lot of videos that are scheduled to come out. So, it'll be talking about this stuff. And once you understand it, you'll see the tactics uh, Trump is using. And he's got the media dancing in, 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 to to his tune, basically. Uh, again, I don't know if Trump is the good guy or just new boss. Like, are we just looking at mob bosses fighting for that one bloody chair at the top? I don't know. But the thing is, is that if he's the real deal, he does keep signaling to Putin, uh, especially on this last meeting, that the press won't talk about it. They won't talk about it. But anybody that watches that, they're like, whoa, that sounded like a man who's talking about how going to war, and, and if you're a progressive watching Trump, if you're listening to the media, they're just going to keep you fired up. But if you go listen to Trump, Trump has basically said the thing that every progressive should be, a true progressive or liberal, should, and pretty much any he, rational human being should be in agreement with. That a thermal nuclear exchange would be an apocalypse unimagined between Russia and the United States. And that is something that none of us want. You know, so this idea of, you know, when Trump comes out there and says, look, even for my own popularity, it, it, it hurts my own popularity to say that getting along with Russia is a good idea. Because you have a lot of neocons out there, these, these so-called conservatives. They're not. They're just, they're just genocidal maniacs. We have to go to war to show that we're strong. They're just idiots. Now, does that mean we trust Russia? No. <laughs> no, we don't trust Russia. But we don't necessarily need to kick them in the nuts until they fire back at us. That's the thing. And that's what the game was, was to get Russia or China to shoot at us first or Iran to attack Israel. This is why I'm still worried about Trump's stance on Israel. But if Trump is not willing to get us into war with Russia by saying he doesn't know if we're going to get along uh, with Russia, but if it did, that wouldn't be a bad thing. That would be great for global peace. Uh, you know, again, I don't think he could sum it up any better. Uh, you know, um, working with Russia is a good thing. Shooting their ship out of the water is a bad thing. And you got like your Fox and your CNN. Well, we we got to take out that spy ship. We got to preemptively strike everything in case a war might break out. Best way to guarantee war, don't you think? This is why I'm against preemptive strikes. This is why I'm against preemptive striking Iran. All that lunacy, because that guarantees your war. The war on terror is a scam. It's it's the United States has a death and debt based economy, and that death and debt based economy is very profitable for the world elites. And again, I'm not picking on all Jews, but it's, it always seems to be a Steena Steiner or Berg. Just look at who the wealthiest people are on the planet. And they all seem to be aligned to going to war with Russia. So to me, I have to call it out as I see it.
call me whatever name, anti Semitic. Those names don't mean anything to me. Like, it, you call that me to that to my face. I'll still shake your hand and have a meal at you and, and, and meal with you and sit down and debate. Uh, because I'm looking at the bigger picture. I'm just the man. I'm just the messenger. I'm irrelevant on the world stage. Uh, I'm irrelevant to the future of mankind. What, but I can be a part of helping people to realize if you want a future to mankind, <laughs> you need to call these people out and just put these ba- crybabies back where they belong. The ones that, oh, we've got to go to war. We're not tough. No, it takes a strong man to stop a war. It takes an idiot to get us into a war. You know, like that, that, that's, you know it, it's easy to get into war. Uh, it's very hard. It'll take a brilliant man to stop idiots from getting us into war. And we'll have to see where Trump goes. Is he the good guy? Is he the bad guy? We've underestimated Trump. Even the people that have voted for Trump have underestimated him to this point. And we're one month in. Can you imagine what the next uh, three years and 11 months are going to be like? Wow. All right. So anyway, if you like this kind of content, please consider making a donation to the channel. Links down below. Thank you so much to everybody who has. Thanks that. Rate, subscribe, share, comment, like. And before somebody says it, no, I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm anti-Zionist. Uh, I'm anti supremacies but I'm also going to tell you that, no, I'm not, I'm not telling people that they shouldn't trust every Jew or anything like that. Because I know that's going to come up. Don't get sidetracked on that. But look at who is. The Steens and Steins and Bergs always seem to be doing this. That's why I bring it up so much. So if you take offense to that, sorry, I'm just the messenger. You know, it's like the doctor who has to come and tell you you got cancer. You know, you blame the doctor. You know, you know what I mean? It's the same thing. I'm, telling it, 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 I'm not telling you it's terminal. I'm telling you there's a problem. You need to, we need to act to that problem. And we need to do it properly so that it doesn't get out of control and worse. So anyway, that's what I'm talking about. So anyway, uh, be true to yourselves. Be true to yourselves. Always do the right thing. And have yourselves a great day. All right. Good day. Hi and welcome. Okay. Where am I going to put this thing? Eh, I'm going to put it right here. We do World War III update. So I can't find any play. Everybody's out, out and about today. It's in the pluses. And uh, everybody's out and about doing what it did. There's a hockey uh, tournament up in... Uh, uh, Otter Lake, uh, the rink, there's kids on the rink here. Everybody's out. It's like kind of like their first real nice day this year. Uh, so everybody's out and about. So I figured I'll do my World War Three update here. I got like four videos to make today. And uh, it's just like, it's like, it's kind of like, it's that kind of spring feeling where you just, you can't concentrate on anything because everything's nice. And went up to Otter Lake, and of course, you know, there's women out, stuff like that too, even if they're not like scantily clad yet. <laughs> you know, that type of thing. But, the, you know, it's just, you know, you, you're like, it's spring, right? It's like, it's like oh, you can't concentrate on anything. So anyway, yeah, you, you bastards make me freaking, this is how dedicated I am to my channel. That even on a spring day, when there's out, women out there playing hockey, and uh, stuff like that. I'm, I'm here at the hall making a video for you guys. Remember that. Remember that. Anyway, okay. Uh, Trump uh, approval rating is up by 55%. Now, like all polls, you know, you got to take them with a grain of salt. But some numbers I can throw at you. Uh, Ronald Reagan was like 58%. Obama, I think, hit 42, 43, maybe 44, 45% at one point. Um... I think uh, the highest uh, was John F. Kennedy was 73%. So think about it this way. The second highest would be Kennedy. Uh, and then I think after that, it's, uh, don't quote me, it might be Truman or something like that. It might be after that. Uh, I, I can't remember which one. And if I'm wrong, I'm sure you guys will correct me. Uh, but uh, he's three points away from the status of Ronald Reagan right now. So that, that tells you a lot. That tells you a lot. If, depending on where the Trump's coming. If it's coming from a, a right-wing organization, obviously take it with a grain of salt. But if it's an actual fair, non-bias, usually anything that shows an approval rating uh, against an, uh, a... I, I'm inclined to believe this number because the approval rating against Obama, okay, you had the media... Yeah, some of the, I'll be fair. Yeah, the media, they didn't handle Obama, like, for example, CNN and Fox News. They didn't handle Obama with baby gloves. Uh, you know... They, but they weren't cr- critical in the right areas. That, that, that's, that's the thing. Um, they basically definitely were off the ball with uh, Clinton, uh, that type of thing. But with Trump, I think the approval rating is probably actually higher than that. Like, I truly believe Trump has beyond the majority. Uh, let's look at it this way. Right now, you can look at it again as a war going on within the intelligence agencies and everything like that. Trying to overthrow. They're still trying to overthrow Trump. Like, he's made it to the, you know, to the third stage of, of becoming a president. You know, he went through the campaign. They couldn't take him out there. He won the, the vote. They couldn't take him out there, and he made it through the inauguration. So now they're trying to maybe take out his, um, his, uh, his the people around him that are basically there to support him, like Flynn. But I'm thinking Flynn might be a long con because Flynn did nothing wrong. There was no reason to fire this guy. 
I think what Flynn, Flynn was was a plan to expose uh, who's leaking the intel. That's what I think. The, the, like it's, it's becoming obvious because it looks like Trump does something that, oh, why, Mr. Trump, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing that. And then it turns around and it's like, oh, wait a minute. He's setting himself for bang, take out this. You know, the response is this, this, and this. And then it sets the people either on his side or the law on his side that he could take out his opponents. It's a very clever game. I, we keep underestimating Trump. Uh, is he a good guy, a bad guy? I don't know. In this world, I don't think there's any, in, when it comes to politics, I don't think there are any good guys. Uh, but nothing is ever black or white. It's always a gray area. And it's really hard to get into the gray area with Trump. I mean, I still don't know what to make of him myself. We can only judge him on his actions. But then he'll do an action that looks like it's the total wrong move and uh, this guy's being a belligerent idiot. And then, it, wow, look what he just set himself up for. And I'll, and I'll get into it in a second. Um, the, tr- the Trump travel ban, okay, which many Middle Eastern uh, factions around the world are saying, no, that's probably a good idea. we got lots of extremism here. You don't want that in your country. You better lock up your borders. Yeah. So he's got support there. Now, of course, I woke up this morning, and uh, even though it's a beautiful, beautiful spring day, to wake up to find more illegal, uh, and I think this was staged by the CBC, the fact that they had the cameras there right when all these freaking migrants are coming, and they're not persecuted in the States. So they have no reason to be coming into our country illegally. Uh, And then if you've got the opposition party, like Thomas Mulcair, saying, get rid of that third uh, state uh, travel ban thing, where basically if uh, a migrant, let's say somebody from the Sudan is fleeing war, and they make it to a European country or to the States or whatever, and they want to come to us and still claim refugee status, well, the Conservatives put in a a ban on that a, a few years back, where you can't do that anymore, because once you make it to a safe country, you're no longer an asylum seeker. At that point, you're an economic migrant, and that is correct. You know, that is correct. Uh, but even the conservatives, because they don't want to appear to be racist, are, are kind of reneging on their own policy. And it's like, no, you know, explain why you put that in. Most people agree with you. So they got the RCMP out there, waiting on one side of the U.S., uh, on the Canadian side of the border, and you got a state trooper on the other side trying to stop the, this family of migrants from crossing. And you got this other guy with a backpack. And we don't know if this guy's a Jew. We don't even know if they're bringing in diseases. I mean, there is no reason for anybody to be illegal, and there is no reason for anybody to be crossing uh, just anywhere. I mean, it just shows you how little respect these people have for our country. Oh, oh well, we're freeing prosecu- persecution. Okay, if you're truly freeing persecution, okay, you're going to go to the border and you're going to come through the, the front door. But they're not doing that because they know at the uh, if they go to a border, that law will apply. But because they, they cross at anywhere, this idea that, you know, you step one foot on our, our soil, you become a citizen, that, that is, that's ridiculous. We can't do that. And people are just taking advantage of that. Now, I don't blame the migrants for taking advantage. They piss me off. Don't get me wrong. It pissed me off. And trust me, the anti-Muslim sentiment in Canada is going up because of things like that. The, you know, if they really wanted to do it right, they do it right. But these families are just coming in for better welfare. That's what they're coming in for. Uh, they'll give you all the sob story on the CBC. But I think these, these um, you know, these sob story kind of pieces that the CBC is doing to get the migrants uh, to show them and go like, it's going to show, because people see the bullshit. They know that these people are not coming in for legitimate reasons. There is no, there's nobody, come, when Randy Quaid tried to get asylum up here in Canada, it didn't work for him. And because everybody, well, number one, he was nuts. Uh, number two, uh, but although he might have a point with his Star Whackers thing, but you know, he does see a little bit more proof. But uh, the, the case in point is, he wasn't fleeing, like, he wasn't, like, the, the, this family saying, well, we're coming from, like, the Sudan uh, originally. Yeah, but that was after you went to a European country, then to the States, and then to here. You're not fleeing persecution. You know, if Donald Trump had people put up against the wall and shot, then you could say, yeah, if you were coming directly from the Sudan to here, you might have a case, uh, or Syria, or wherever it might be. But you get the idea that these people, they're just taking advantage. So that's starting, it's not as bad as Europe because they can't just flood in in mass numbers. But a thousand people in a week, that, that's too much for Canada. So that's, times that by the welfare, so you're looking at about 600 bucks a person per month to take care of, probably somewhere around that. A thousand people. Do the math. Then, where's your retirement going? Where is, why is our, our hospitals closing? Or, or wait times so astronomical? Uh, why are, you know, the potholes? Uh, like, again, these people are taking advantage. And unfortunately, all the parties are so focused on political correctness. Uh, some are focused on Agenda 